good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are we doing? Good. I'll we'll say welcome to the folks at West Fort Worth, folks at our Dallas campus as well, and welcome to everybody who is joining us online too. My name is David, and it is an honor to be with you today uh, on this New Year's Eve. <clears throat> so how many has uh, party uh, plans later tonight? Now you're a little nervous because you're in church. All right, how many are you going to celebrate later tonight? Is that said better? Right? I want you to know that we can celebrate while we're in church as well. And one of the things that when we come to a new year, not only do we celebrate, but we also reflect. And so this past week, I've just been reflecting a little bit on the previous year and especially the teachings that I've heard from our senior pastor, Rick Atchley. Started the year with a series on, on soulful, deep care for our souls, and a series late spring that was, let's talk about mental health and how important a conversation that is to have because our mental health is critically important to our flourishing. You think about late summer, he did a, a series called How to Be Good and Rich. In other words, how can we care for what it is that the Lord is entrusting to us? And in the fall, as we are always wanting to become more like Jesus, a series that was called It's a Must, and it, what it looks like to be more like Jesus, we must do these things. And I don't know about you, but I was greatly encouraged. I was inspired, but more important than any in that, I was changed. I was transformed because of the ways that the Lord has used Rick's teachings in my life. And I hope that you can say the same. Can we just thank him real quick for what it is that he continues to do? Yes. Don't worry, Rick, there's so much more room that we have to look more like Jesus to. You have plenty of job security, right? Hey, as I think back, I also think back on the series in Christmas that was said, Fearless Christmas. And I remember that Rick said this one comment that he said that, you know, when you look at somebody's life and if you see that it is full of fear, you're going to find that it's pretty absent of joy. But the inverse is true as well, that if you see a life that is full of joy, you don't see a whole lot of fear. Because while fear is a stealer of joy, more importantly, joy is a killer of fear. And so what I hope to help you with today that someone taught me one day is how I can be more secure and more assured in my relationship with God. And when I know that relationship is strong and sound and safe, that is when I experience the most joy in my life. And I would love for you to enter into 2024 as a joyful person. And as we enter into this new series coming up, follow the way that we want to follow the ways of Jesus. We want to be more like Jesus because it leads to the absolute best life that we can possibly live. But in order to know that we need to move towards joy, we got to be honest that Sometimes the world is just a hard place. And there are challenging things that are done to us, poor decisions that we make and contribute and add to the brokenness of the world, and it has an impact. It has an impact on our relationship with the Lord. In fact, Isaiah, Isaiah 59 2 says this it says, It's your sins, those mistakes, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because your sins he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Well, there's the old bait and switch, right? It's going to be a joy sermon, and all of a sudden, here we go. You're just cut off from God. No, I'm not trying to do that at all, but I am being realistic. And it's something that we already know within the core of who we are, that when we live in ways that we shouldn't, it has an impact on our relationship with the Lord. But that's not the end of our story, not even close. Because regardless of what your mistakes look like, the Lord has never stopped pursuing you, never stopped loving you, never stopped desiring to be in a relationship with you. And 1 John 4.10 says it this way. It says, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son, Jesus, sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. In other words, to take away the very obstacles, the very barriers that were getting in the way of being in a relationship with him. He sent Jesus. He demonstrates his love that he sent Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners so that we can be in a relationship with him and with him forever. 
And so if it's taken away our sins, it kind of starts to beg the question a little bit of like, okay, so all of our sins, our past sins, uh, the, what, what about the sins we're committing? It, it can create some confusion. And that's why I love this verse. This is the verse that we're going we're gonna to park on today. It's 1 Peter 3.18. Listen to this. Christ suffered for our sins. There was a payment that was required of our sins. He suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. Not to stay separated, but to come safely home to God. But here's the deal. If you're anything like me, sometimes you read that verse and you don't read that Jesus did it once for all time, but you kind of read it that I've got one shot to take advantage of what Jesus has done for me. And if I blow it, now I'm really host because I had that one shot. If you're a follower of Jesus, you, you find yourself in a place that, man, I knew who Jesus was. I believed that he was the son of God. I accepted what he's done for me. I believe that he stepped out of that tomb. I've been coming to church. I've been reading my Bible. I got baptized. I've been doing the dance. I've been doing all the things that I'm supposed to do. But there was that moment. There was that time. There was that season where I made that decision that I knew that I wasn't supposed to make. And I knew it was wrong in the moment. And I went ahead and made it anyway. And now... I've blown that one chance that I had. Or maybe you're here today and you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus yet and you, you know that life needs to be better. You know that it's been a struggle and you, and you feel a little lost and you feel a little unsure and you, and you question, just, are you worth anything? Do you have any point to your life? And you think, okay, if, I, if my sins can be forgiven, that's great, but... But I know that I'm just going to keep sinning. And so if that's the case, then I, I, need to, I need to figure this out. Because if I've got one shot, I don't want to take it too soon. And so let me go try to get cleaned up. And then after that, oh, I'll come to Jesus. Friends, that's not what Scripture teaches. What the Word of God teaches is that you just need to realize that you need to be cleansed. And then you come to Jesus, and he does all the cleaning. Amen? Amen. 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 And that is what I want to help you realize today. But your, your difficulty with this isn't unique to you. It's been a problem ever since man's been around. If you know anything about King David, he had this struggle. You may not know who King David is, but maybe you've heard the story of David and Goliath and that young shepherd boy that killed that giant. He grew up to become a king. And yet even though he was a king over Israel. Oh, he was a mess. Sexual immorality, murder, all sorts of crazy things that had gone on in his life, and a lot because of the bad decisions that he had made. And in Psalm 51, we see this moment where he's just being very honest and very real, and he's just kind of crying out. But you know what he cries out? He says, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Notice that he doesn't say, restore your salvation to me. Because his salvation was never in question. Even with the mistakes that he had made, the grace that God had offered him was greater than all of those mistakes. And that's what 1 Peter 3.18 can teach all of us. Because it says that he died once for all time. Like, what does all time mean? Does it, it means forever, right? But like, which direction? Like all the ones in the past? That seems too good to be true, but maybe I can get there. But what about this one that I'm wrestling with now? Oh, and does this mean that I can't sin anymore in the future? Friends, once for all time means all the ones in the past, all the ones in the present, and all the ones you haven't even committed yet. And that is great news. But how is it possible? I can't tell you that I got it all figured out by any stretch. But I had somebody teach me one time what I want to show you that I think will help you, especially when it comes to the sins that you haven't even committed yet. Because again, the enemy's going, you should know better, you should know better, and he's chirping, and all of a sudden we make those mistakes and now we think we've been disqualified, and that is not true. So let's go back to that verse. And the best way I know how to um, kind of illustrate a time, the time is to do a timeline. And so we're going to throw up this timeline up on the screen, and you can see... Zero, that's roughly when Jesus was born. 
33, you see the cross. That's roughly when Jesus was crucified. This is when your sins were paid for. It said Christ suffered for our sins. This is showing this is where that suffering happens. Let's give it a little bit of context, and we'll kind of, let's add the, the Hall of Fame of the Old Testament up there, okay? And so now you'll see Abraham, 2000 BC, there's Moses at 1500, David's at 1000, Daniel's at 500, round numbers, pretty close. We're starting to get some context of what all this looks like. But now we want to make it personal. Like, what does it mean to us? What does it mean to you? So let's add present day on there. You'll see now that we've added, there's 2023, but also you notice that I've added 1983 on there. Do the math. That's 40 years ago. Let's just, um, let's presuppose that I'm talking to someone who hasn't surrendered to Jesus yet, talking to them about the gospel, that Jesus died for them, all their sins can be paid for, and they were born in 1983. They've lived for 40 years, and I ask them, okay, so how many mistakes have you made in your life? And they're like, well, that's kind of a personal question. I'm like, I know, but we kind of got to get to the good stuff for you to understand all that Jesus has done for you. Like, how many times? And they're like, man, I don't even know how to count that much. And I said, okay, if we said two million, would that be offensive? They're like, no, two million sounds good, so we add two million to the, to the deal, right? Now, I don't say this to be judgmental. I don't say this to cause any, any shame or any guilty. My first 40, 40 was greater than two million. I can assure you of that, Okay. What I want you to know is that we're all in this together. Romans 3.23 says this, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. We are going to keep it real here. And so as we go back to the timeline and we realize that there are two million sins that we're saying need to be forgiven, and we're actually starting, this person's going, man, that, that can actually be true. But then they have this thought, but what about the future? I really feel like I'm going to mess up again. And if I mess up again, is it going to disqualify? And is all that, and so I, especially when I talk to folks that struggle with addiction, this is really something that's hard for them because they, 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 they're so scared that they're going to use again and, they, and they, they, they so desperately need this news, but they're like, but I got to go get clean first. And just like I said earlier, it's not about getting clean first, but it's about recognizing that Jesus is the one that can cleanse you. And here's the reality. When you say yes to Jesus, you're going to sin again. It doesn't mean that you are sinless moving forward, although you are in the eyes of God because they've all been paid for. But it also means that as you follow Jesus and you hang out with him more, guess what? You're going to sin less. So as I'm talking to that 40-year-old, what might happen in the next 40 years? Well, they're still going to make mistakes, right? They're still going to commit sins. How many? We're not sure. We're going to guess, but we'll, we'll say, let's say a million. We'll put that up on the screen. A million's a lot, but it's also a million less than what they were doing before. Look at the progress. Look at their moving towards the image of Jesus into the likeness of Christ. But we struggle with the fact that that million, can it really be forgiven? I'm, I'm worried about it. Romans 8, 38 tries to help us with that a little bit. It says this, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Amen. It's crazy, but every single sin that you've committed, past, present, and future, show the screen, once for all time. They've all been paid for. And somewhere along the way, we think that whenever it was that we said yes to Jesus, that's when our sins were paid for. No, they were always paid at 33 at the cross. And if you look at the 2 million in relationship to the cross, it's after the fact. It's in the same spot that the next million are as well. And if you can believe that those 2 million are covered, then you can also believe that those million are covered. And that is great news. That starts to free you up and not be held in this bondage that now what was a gift has turned into some kind of performance. It's not about performance. And sometimes what helps us understand even more is, is to try to even have a, a greater understanding of the magnitude of the grace and the price and what Jesus has done at the cross. And again, remember we talked about all of those Hall of Famers in the Old Testament. Well, what about them? 
When they were sinning, Jesus hadn't even lived yet. At least on earth, he hadn't gone to the cross. Nothing had been paid for. Are they okay? Well, here's what Romans 3 tells us. This is such good news. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Here we go. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. In other words, he's talking about all those Old Testament folks, not just the four dudes on the line, but everybody that's lived before. For he was looking ahead and including them and in what he would do in this present time, not 2023, but biblical present time in 33 AD. When we look at that timeline again, we see once for all time means for everyone all time, past, present, and future. Can we get an amen in the house, please? And just to show you another place in scripture that says something similar, let's look at Hebrews 7. It says this, he is the kind of high priest we need, talking about Jesus, because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart. Jesus has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once. Say once. Jesus did this once for all. For who? For all. Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as the sacrifice for the people's sins. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah indeed. And as you're hearing this, if what's starting to maybe rise up a little bit in your mind of going, all right, is this guy saying that it doesn't matter if we sin in the future? That it's already all paid for, and so if it's already all paid for and Jesus has already suffered and he's already died, then I just keep on sinning and just keep on living the way that I want to live and everything's going to be okay. And is that, is that what we're teaching today? And if that's a little bit of what you're wrestling with, I would say thank you, because it means that maybe I'm getting close to trying in some way to express the majesty and the magnitude and the beauty of grace and all that Jesus has done for you. But just so we're crystal clear, I want you to know that you're not the first person that has wrestled with this question. And in fact, as Paul was writing to the Romans, this came up as well, and this is how Paul responded at the beginning of Romans 6. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is a gift that sets you free from your sin. And you have been made in the image of the one who made you. And that's not just physical presence, but that's character and integrity. You've been made in the image of God. And you've been made in such a way that when you know how much you're worth and whose you are and all that's been done for you, it steers you to live in a different way than you have in the past. Think of it in these terms. Think of a fish that, that's swimming along and kind of comes up to the, to the surface of the water and there's this beautiful deck and it's a sunny day and there's some flowers that are there and the fish just wants to get up and kind of lay out a little bit and get a tan. I'm not sure that fish can do that, but it makes the story better, all right? So it wants to smell the roses as well, right? What happens when that fish jumps out and lands on that deck? He immediately starts to suffocate. Immediately starts to flounder immediately starts to die because the air is not its nature. It wasn't, de it wasn't designed for that. It was designed to live in the water. You were not designed to pursue a life of sin. It will lead to bondage and suffocation and floundering and death. But when you live in the ways that God has commanded you to live, it leads to flourishing and to joy and to peace and to patience. Incredible fruit that the Spirit will display in your life. 
And if we can live from that place, Hills Church, 2024 is going to look like, it's not going to look like any other year that we've lived before. Because here's the thing. There's three key points that I want to show you what once for all time means. Been hanging around Rick for a while. You give a sermon, you got to have three points, right? And then you got to hold your fingers up weird and go, i got three points for you, okay? That's what he does. The first point is this. Once for all time shouts, Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient. He's paid for all your sins in the past, all the sins you're committing, all the sins that you haven't even committed yet, and yet the enemy comes along and tries to tell you what? Oh, you knew better. You shouldn't have done that. You, you have used up whatever the limit of uh, free sins that came with your baptism. Uh, you, have got, you, have, you have sinned beyond what grace can reach. All of those things are lies straight from hell. Because if it were true, how would you ever know? How would you ever know if you're back in God's graces? What kind of dad would that be that would never want to tell you whether or not he loved you? Whether or not you were in, his, in, in good standing with him or not? You mess up a little bit, you better do more good than you just messed up, and you're just in this constant battle. And you know what the enemy's doing when he's doing that? He is distracting you. He is sidelining you. He is keeping you from the wonderful things that God planned for you from long ago because you are his masterpiece. And that's what he wants for you. Remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross, it's getting close to the end of his life, cries out that he's thirsty, and they try to give him some sour wine. And, and then John 19, 30 says this. It says, when Jesus had tasted it, talking about that wine, and then he said, it is finished. Say that with me, church. It is finished. Then he bowed his head and released his spirit. The payment that was necessary for all of the debt that you've incurred through all the sins that you've committed are committing or ever will commit was paid in that moment by the perfect sacrificial life of Jesus. And that's how much God loves you. Once for all time shouts of Jesus' sufficiency of the cross. Once for, time, once for all time also secures our identity in Christ. When you said yes, you became new. You are a new creature. You were in, adopted into the family. Romans 8, 15 through 17 says it like this. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. We were already that to sin before. Instead, you received God's spirit, Holy Spirit, when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. We've been adopted in. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. And in fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Let's be honest. I wish that sentence wasn't there. I don't want to share in his suffering. I want to say yes to Jesus. I want all my sins to go away. And I want all my problems to go away with them, past, present, and future. And I don't want it to be hard anymore. And yet, the reality is, is that we are still living in a broken world. Yes, Jesus has come and he suffered and he has put death to death and he has defeated sin. And we are promised that he is going to come back and set everything right. But we are in the middle of that now and there is going to be heartache and suffering. Some of you know that at a level that I've never even experienced. You're in the midst of a medical crisis that you don't even know what the other side's going to look like. And when you really evaluate what it is that you're going through and you think about your life, you're going, how is this even fair that this is what I'm having to walk through or this is what my child is walking through or my spouse or some other loved one in my life? Or you've been battling a career for however long and you just kind of want to get ahead and yet everything that you try to do, there's always somebody in the way, there's always some certification in the way, there's always some other accident in the way that just keeps you living paycheck to paycheck and you're just wondering, is the, are these financial troubles ever going to leave me? Fill in whatever that suffering and whatever that hardship is. But no that when the enemy tries to tell you that that is evidence 
that God doesn't love you, that you deserve it because of the bad decisions that you've made, and he's just up there taking joy out of punishing you. Those are lies that are straight from hell. It is hard living in a broken world, but we do it with a hope. Jesus even says, I tell you all of these things. I try to help you see this peace because take heart, dear friends, for I have overcome the world. And his promise is that one day there will be no more tears and no more sorrow and no more death and no more pain. And God will walk amongst his children and he will live with them forever. That is our future. And when we know that, it brings us immense joy. And the third point I want to make for you today is once for all time sends us into a broken world. If we've been set free, if we've been given a new identity, if these things are true and they are true, how can we keep it to ourselves? How can we not live in such a way that we want other people to be able to know this as well and that they can experience this same joy that we are experiencing? And all of a sudden now we don't just see lives being transformed, but we see families being transformed in communities and our country and the world. This is what God has called us to. We know it as the Great Commission at the end of Matthew, and it says this, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I looked up into the age. It says, even in the middle of a election year. Okay? <laughs> Here's the deal, Hills family. We're about to walk into 2024, presidential election year of this country. We're going to do it better than we did it in 2020. And I don't mean as a country, I mean as a church. Because our eyes are set on ways that are higher than the ways of this country. And we're not going to put our trust in some system. We're going to put our trust in the fact that Jesus loves us so much that he came and he died and he paid for all of our sins once for all time, all in the past, all in the present, and all in the future. And does this assurance have an expiration date? No way. No way. If you ever get to a place where you're doubting and you're just not sure, know that you're not the first and you're not the last. But there's hope and reassurance that can be found in God's Word. And if you're ever just going, so where am I supposed to look in this big old book to try to find any hope? Just go to Romans 8. That's the cheat sheet, okay? It's like the cliff notes of all scripture. Just go to, it's the best chapter in all of scripture. And then if you want to go cheat a little more, just read the last few verses, right? Because that's what we're going to do together. Because I want you to know how long this lasts. And this is what Paul says in Romans 8, starting in verse 35. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted, or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death. No, all that says is that we're still in a broken world. All that says is it's still hard. But does it mean that we've been separated from Christ's love? If we're talking about separating from Christ's love, it's people that are in Christ's love. It's talking to believers. And yet there is still the potential that we will experience all of these things. And does it mean that we have been forsaken, that we've been abandoned, that we've been let go? No. Despite all these things, all of them, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us, who loves us, who will always love us. I am convinced, Peter, Paul is saying, I am convinced. I'm not so worried about Paul right now. What about you? Are you convinced, Hill's family? Are you convinced that this is true for you? Are you convinced that nothing can ever separate you from God's love? Are you convinced that neither death nor life can separate you from God's love? Are you convinced that neither angels nor demons can separate you from God's love? Are you convinced that neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell, 
can separate us from God's love because God has no rival. He has no equal. He is undefeated. He has won every battle. All of his promises end in yes and amen. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation. Let me ask you a question. Are you a part of creation? Yes. Have you made bonehead decisions? Yes. Did the preacher just call you a bonehead? Yes, sorry. But nothing in all creation, nothing, including the bad decisions that you've made and probably the bad decisions that you're going to make again will ever separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I am here to tell you that when you know that and you accept that and you live in that, then all of a sudden those poor decisions that I keep bringing up start to fall off to the wayside. Because now Holy Spirit is living in you and empowering you and reminding you that you are not a slave to sin, but you have been set free. And not just for your good, but for good for all of those that are around you. And that's the posture, that's the place that as we step into this next series that Rick's about to teach us, follow the way. That's why we want to be more like Jesus. Will you bow with me, please? (coughs) Excuse me. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, you are so good. It is overwhelming. It almost seems too good to be true. But your word says differently. And your word is truth. You are an honest God. You never lie. And Lord, we want to live from that truth. We want to live filled with that kind of joy. To know that once for all time, all of our sins have been paid for, and therefore they have been removed from us as far as the east is from the west. That when you hung on that cross in a place that you did not deserve to be, in a place that each of us deserved to be, and you screamed out, it is finished, you actually meant that it is finished. And we now live lives that are new and liberated and empowered. And we realize that we are your chosen people. We are a holy nation. We are your prized possession. Why? So that we can proclaim the goodness of who you are. We want to be in a place where we are ready to give an account for the hope that we have in Jesus. We want to recognize that any conversation that we can walk into with somebody else, when the Holy Spirit is living inside of us, that that conversation could change eternity when we are gracious and kind and merciful and courageous and willing to introduce people to Jesus. Lord, we want to be a people that we get splinters on our hands because we want to push back the gates of hell. And we are reminded that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is alive in us. And that is the same spirit that the enemy has to flee because you have no rival and you have no equal. And we not only want to see our lives changed and our families changed and our community changed, but we want to see eternity changed, Lord. We ask for nations and generations at this church because it aligns with your heart and your will. And all of that is beyond our capabilities, but all of it is possible with you. And so, Lord, may we walk into 2024 thankful for all that you've done, but expecting that you would do even more. We love you, and we pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. And the church said, amen, amen.